Hello, fourth grade, and welcome to Unit 6, Week 5. We have four vocabulary words today, and then we have some literary terms because this week has a focus on poetry. So our first vocabulary word is the word gobble. So to gobble is to grab something easily and to uh, easily or greedily. So when you gobble something up, you can either gobble it, like for example, if you're eating something, right, you're grabbing it and eating it in a way that, you know, you're super hungry, or you can talk about how a, uh, how a sewing machine will gobble up the thread uh, when it's, when you're sewing two pieces of fabric together, right? So it's something that's pulling it in greedily or easily. Next, we have the word mist. Mist is like a cloud of tiny water droplets in the air. A lot of times you'll find mist in the morning uh, if you go outside or if you're standing by the ocean, you might feel the ocean mist like little droplets of water spraying at you in the air. Our next word is the word root. You have roots in a place when you feel like you belong to that place. So just like a plant has roots in the ground, that's where it belongs, that's where it grew up, that's where it came from. Um, people feel like they have roots in a place where they live or where their family is or where they were born or if they have a lot of family members in that place, they, they feel like they have roots there. And our last vocabulary word is the word individuality. Individuality comes from the word individual, which means something that makes you unique. So individuality is a quality that you have that makes you unique or different from other people. Now, our two literary terms that we're going to focus on today are imagery and personification. So imagery comes from the word image, which means like a picture, right? Imagery is when you use specific and very detailed or descriptive language to help someone create a picture or an image in their mind. You're helping them to imagine. See how all of these words are related? Image, imagine, imagery, they all come from the same root. So a lot of times an author or a writer will use what we call sensory words to help create imagery. And sensory words are words that appeal to your five senses. So words that describe sounds or the way something tastes or looks or uh, how something feels and so on and so on. So I gave a few examples of the word imagery. So we can say glittering white, the blanket of snow covered everything in sight. So glittering white, you're thinking of something that's sparkly, right? You're imagining something that's sparkly. And then when they say a blanket of snow, you can imagine it kind of covering it the same way a blanket would cover you when you're laying in bed. The next sentence, the golden sunlight filtered down through the pale new leaves on the tree. So the golden sunlight, right? It show, it, it helps you imagine that golden color. And it filtered through the pale new leaves. So pale is describing the color. So when you see a plant grow new leaves, they're usually lighter colored than the more mature older leaves or the leaves that have been there longer or the ones that are bigger. They filter through the pale new leaves on the tree. So you're imagining in your head this golden sunlight that's coming through in little pieces um, in between the openings or the spaces between these leaves. The booming thunderstorm and the blinding lightning scared the little child. So booming is describing the sound, something loud um, and kind of shocking, right? And the blinding lightning. So blinding, it's so bright, it hurts your eyes. So all of these are describing words. They're sensory words in all of these sentences that help you to form this image in your head, right? This helps you to imagine exactly what the author is talking about. Now, personification is something different, which is also a really cool writing skill or a writing strategy that you can use where you're giving human qualities to something that's not human, personification. You're making it like a person. So when I say lightning danced across the sky, lightning doesn't actually dance, people can dance. So I'm giving it a quality or a description that I would usually give to a human but I'm giving that description to a non-human thing. Personification means you're giving something the qualities of a person or a human. So if I say the wind howled in the night, wind can't howl. That's not a thing that wind can do, but it does provide a really good description and help you to imagine what's going on and what it sounds like by using that element of personification. I say the car complained as the driver started it up. So you can imagine what it sounds like when a person complains and kind of apply that same kind of 
whiny crankiness to the sound a car might make when it's not running very well. Rita heard the last piece of pie calling her name, right? So I think all of you guys can imagine seeing a piece of pie or a cookie kind of sitting out in front of you. And you almost feel like it's calling your name, right? Because it, it's, it looks so tasty and you want to go over there and eat it. So all of these different elements uh, are these interesting and amazing strategies that authors use to help develop their writing so that it's so much more interesting for you as the reader. And by learning these skills, you're going to be able to make your writing so much more interesting for your readers. Now, our spelling words for this week are going to focus on prefixes and suffixes, all of the things that we've already talked about before. So our words are unchanged, unnamed, restate, reverse, infrequent, invisible, prepaid, displeased, action, establishment, oversized, prejudge, interstate, intersect, deflate, semi-weekly, happily, kindness, finally, fearful, really, handful, happiness, transplant, and superhuman. Now for our notes for this week, we're going to be talking or reviewing metaphors. So remember, we've talked about similes and metaphors, and we say that we've talked about how both of them compare two things that are unlike, they're unlike each other. That means two different things. Now the most important thing about metaphors and about similes is you need to be able to identify what are the two things we're comparing. So with a metaphor, you're going to find that it's telling you that one thing is another thing. So these were words that give you a hint about what's being compared are the words am, is, are, was, and were. When you find those words in between, it's usually telling you that one thing is another thing. So if it's a, if our first one says, I am a sleepy sloth today, I'm comparing myself, I, to a sloth. And that word am is my clue word. If I say life is a roller coaster, I'm comparing life to a roller coaster. Her eyes are sky blue. I'm comparing her eyes or the color her, of her eyes to the sky blue color. So the, the, that really light blue that we see in the sky. The Palm Lake surface was a mirror. So I'm comparing the lake surface, like the, the top of the water, to a mirror. So the water was so calm, it was reflecting the mirror. Or the snowflakes were a white blanket on the grass when we woke up this morning. So the snowflakes were what? I'm comparing the snowflakes to a white blanket. Now we said our uh, spelling words were focused on prefixes and suffixes, so we're going to look at a few more prefixes and suffixes here. Again, all words that we've looked at before. Prefixes come before a word, suffixes come at the end of a word, and they both have one job, which is to modify the meaning of the base word that you're sticking them onto. So prefix and suffix both come from the word affix, which means to stick to something or to attach to something. So you're just changing where you're attaching it to the word, either before or after. So some of the prefixes that we've talked about before are the word re, or sorry, the prefix re, which means again, like rewrite, rewash, reread, un, which means not, like unhappy, unclean, unfair. This means the opposite of something. Pre means before. Inter means between. So interrupt, intersect, international. Suffixes, we said, come at the end of the word, and we have the suffix full, which means full of something like beautiful, less, which is the opposite, which means it doesn't have that thing like fearless. Now, I did put in a note in here. So if you have a word like penniless, right? We know the word penny is P-E-N-N-Y, but when I spell penniless, I spell it P-E-N-N-I-L-E-S-S. So if my base word ends with a consonant and the letter Y, remember to change that Y to an I before you add the suffix. We also have the suffix mint, which means the state of something. So enjoyment is the state of enjoying something. Entertainment is being entertained. Able and ible both have the same meaning, which means it's capable of 
doing something, you're able to do something. Um, the only difference is you use able when the root word is already a whole word. So preventable, prevent is a word by itself. Adaptable, adapt is a word by itself. Predictable, predict is a word by itself. Ible, I-B-L-E, is the one you use when your root word is not a complete word, so it can't stand alone. So if I say something is edible, ed by itself is not a word. If, uh, if I say something is divisible, divis is not a word by itself. So able is when you're adding it to a whole word. Ible is when you're adding it to a word part that can't stand alone by itself. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is combining sentences. So we can combine sentences lots of ways. First, coordinating conjunctions by using the fanboys. So I want to go to the park, but I don't want to go to the store. And our fanboys are for and nor, but, or, so, and yet, or yet and so. Those are right here. I gave you an example sentence. So we've already talked about this. I'm not going to spend much time on it. A positives and a positive phrases. Now, this is also something we've talked about a couple times in the past. A positives or a positive phrases, they rename the noun and they describe it. And they usually come, uh, they, they describe the noun that came right before it. So you'll have your noun first, then you'll have your a positive phrase that renames it or gives you extra information about it. And then you have the rest of your sentence. And the way that you know it's in a positive is it's extra information. So what does that mean? That means if I take that a positive or that a positive phrase out of the sentence, my sentence still makes sense. It's still a complete sentence. So the example sentence I used before, I'm going to use it again just to refresh your memory. Uh, we were combining the two sentences, Hermione Granger is, an accomplished, is accomplished at spells. She is a witch at Hogwarts school. I can put those together by saying Hermione Granger a witch at Hogwarts school. So that phrase, a witch at Hogwarts school, tells me more about Hermione Granger. So Hermione Granger, comma, a witch at Hogwarts school, comma, is accomplished at spells. So the core of my sentence is that Hermione Granger is accomplished at spells. But by adding that extra a positive phrase, I get bonus information about her, right? It tells me more. So it renames her. It doesn't just tell me her name, it also tells me that she's a witch at Hogwarts school. Now adverbs are words that tell us more about the verb and they almost always answer the question how, when, where, how often, and in what way. So most adverbs will end in L-Y. So the way that you're doing something, slowly, loudly, carefully, quickly, quietly, these are adverbs. Next, we have adjectives. So before I go on to adjectives for adverbs, so I can say, uh, they read the book, they read very quickly. I can put that together to say, they read their book quickly. So I'm taking those two sentences over here. Here's my sentence. Um, they read their books, they were quick. I can change that to say, they read their book quickly or books quickly. So you're taking two simple sentences that are kind of boring by themselves. You put them together, you make them a little more interesting, a little bit easier to read. Now for adjectives, when we're combining adjectives or we're combining sentences with adjectives, I can take two simple sentences again. My coat is very warm, it is red. So the adjectives here are warm and red. I can put those together into one sentence. I can say my red coat is very warm. And we have correlative conjunctions. So correlative conjunctions are word pairs that are used together. So if, then, either, or, things like that. And I do have a whole list of examples for, the, for you about correlative conjunctions. If you scroll all the way down to here. So here's a whole bunch of correlative conjunctions in this nice teal and blue uh, diagram. So they're word pairs that we use to put sentences together. If we go to the zoo, then we can see the pandas. Now, the next bit about participles and particip participial phrases 
is a little bit more involved. You don't need to know these in depth too much now, but you are going to be learning them anyway. So it's good to get familiar with them now so that it's easy for you later when you have to focus on them a little bit more in depth. So participles and participial phrases are verbs or verb phrases that are used as adjectives to describe the noun in the sentence. What does that mean? So participles usually end in ing for present tense and ed or en for past tense. So if my verb is to rise, I could say the rising sun. So how is this a participle? Rising is actually a verb, right? It's a thing that happens, it's, it's a thing that's done, but I'm using that verb to describe the sun. So the rising sun. So this verb is now also used as an adjective. That's what makes it a participle. Or if I say the past in past tense, I can say the risen sun. So the sun that already rose. If my verb is boil, so I can say the boiling water. Boiling is a verb, right? It's a thing that happens. It's the thing that's done. But when I say the boiling water, since it's sitting right before that noun, it's describing that noun and it's functioning or it's working as an adjective. It's, what kind of water is it? It's boiling water. What kind of sun is it? It's the rising sun. Or past tense, the boiled water. So I'm taking these words that are usually verbs, but when I stick them right before a noun, now they become an adjective also. They're describing the noun. They're telling how the noun or what the noun is doing. So if we have the verb to break, I can say the breaking news or the broken news, or I can say the breaking glass and the broken glass. That's easier for you guys to, to understand. I have the word to cook. Cook is a verb, right? It's a thing that you do. I can say the cooking chicken smells delicious, right? Cooking is now describing the chicken. It's telling us what the chicken is doing or the cooked chicken. So I gave you guys a few example sentences for present and past tense participles and particip participial phrases we're going to get to in a little bit. So I watched the boiling water in the pot. So boiling, since it's coming before the noun water, is now a participle. Her caring nature made her one of the nicest people I know. Her nature, which is basically her personality and the way that she is, is now being described by the word caring. So caring isn't just a verb, now it's an adjective too. The boy studied for the spelling bee for weeks, making him a deserving recipient of the prize. So the recipient, the person who receives the prize, right, is deserving. So this deserving is now an adjective. A laughing man is stronger than a suffering man. So laughing, even though it's a verb, it's a thing that you do, I'm using it to describe the man. He is, what kind of man is he? He's a laughing man. This one, what kind of man is he? He is a suffering man. Next, I have the example, the animal shelter had saved a starving dog from an abandoned building. So starving, even though it's a verb, it's something that happens when you don't eat, right? Starving is now being used to describe the dog in the sentence. So that makes it a participle. Next sentence, the sleeping man, was comfortable and warm under his blankets. Sleeping, even though it's a verb, in this sentence it's used as an adjective becomes because it's coming before a noun that it's describing. So participles, past tense. So these were all present tense. You saw that they had an ing at the end of them. Past tense, the broken window. Broken is a verb so when something gets broken, but it's being used as an adjective to describe the window. So the old house had a broken window. The girl added flowers to the painted frame. Uh, we passed the model of the destroyed bridge from the movie. After walking uh, into a tree, he had a swollen eye for two days. She tried to open the locked door. So anytime you're seeing a noun after it, it's a participle. If there is no noun after it, then it's not a participle. So you can change the order around a little bit, but if you don't see that it's referring to a noun, then it's not participle. Now, participle phrases are basically the participle word plus the other words that come after it. So again, these are things that you can take out of the sentence, just like the appositive phrases, and you still have a whole sentence. 
So it's really common to see participles in participial phrases. A participial phrase participial phrase also acts like an adjective, but it's a group of words, not just a single word. Uh, so the man carrying the bricks is my father. So carrying the bricks is describing my father. I can take that out of the sentence if I want to and say the man is my father. That's still a whole sentence. For the next one, she showed us a plate of scones crammed with cream. So she showed us a plate of scones is perfectly fine as a sentence by itself, but crammed with cream is describing the scones. That means they were full of cream. Whistling the same tune as always, Ted touched the front of his cap with his forefinger as she dismounted. So remember, our participles usually end with an ing if they're present tense or ed if they're past tense. So whistling the same tune always. This, my participial phrase here is at the beginning of my sentence, it's followed by a comma. So when it starts a sentence, you have a comma after it. When it's later on in the sentence, there's no comma. So I can take that part out and say, Ted touched the front of his cap, so on, so on. And that's still a whole sentence. So whistling the same tune is describing Ted, right? That phrase is being used as an adjective. The last one we have here says, stunned by the blow, my quickly gathered his senses and searched frantically for the pepper spray. So stunned by the blow, that's describing Mike. So he is stunned, he is shocked. Uh, you know, he got hit over the head. It, all of these things are describing how Mike is or how Mike is feeling right now. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about are prepositions. Now, a preposition shows a relationship between a word in a sentence and the object of the preposition. So what does that mean? The object of a preposition is the noun that comes after the preposition. So look at the word itself. It is prepositioned, right? Pre means before. So it is positioned before the noun that it's talking about. The preposition is relating the object to something in the sentence. So prepositions can never be alone. They're usually in a phrase. If it's alone, it will function actually kind of like an adverb, but without an without the object. So remember, an adverb describes how, when, where, how often, and in what way. We talked about that uh, right over here. So number three, we talked about adverbs. Now you see over here, my example sentence for adverbs, it says, they read their book quickly. So this doesn't have anything after it. So you see the adverb and there's no object. So we know that it's just an adverb. If it has an object after it, a noun after it, then we know it's a prepositional phrase. So the flower in the vase is a peony. In is my preposition and it's relating the flower to the vase. It's telling me where that thing is. So remember our prepositions ask how, when, where, how often, and in what way. So the word in is my preposition. It's relating the flower to the vase. The umbrella with the polka dots is Marianne's. So with is my preposition here. It's relating the umbrella to the polka dots. We will be going to the movies. So to is my preposition here. It's showing the relationship between uh, where we are going and the movies. My lunch period is after science. So again, this tells me when. After is my preposition. It relates my lunch period to science class. You are walking on your tiptoes. On is my preposition here. It's relating the way I'm walking to my tiptoes. So it's, it's a way to make your sentence whole and to make your sentence make sense. So the prepositional phrases are going to be the phrases that I highlighted over, or sorry, I, I bolded in the sentence. So that preposition, the word itself is in, with, to, after, on. There are lots of prepositions, not just these, but this is just to get you familiar with what they are and what kinds of word they, words they are. So um, in the vase is a prepositional phrase. So in is my preposition. The vase is the object of my preposition, right? Because remember, we said the object comes right after the preposition. The preposition is 
pre-position. That means it's put right before the object that it's describing. With the polka dot, so with is a preposition, the polka dot is the object. To the movies, to is my preposition, the movies is the object. After science class, so after was my preposition, science class was the object. On your tiptoes, so on was the preposition and tiptoes was the, was the object. I know there's a lot of information to take in all at once. I did give you guys some visuals that you can look at. These are some of our most commonly used prepositions. There are several more. So in, at, for, by, on, from, um, anything related to those kinds of words, anything that answers your questions about how, when, where, how often, and in what way are prepositions. Our coordinating conjunctions, in case you forgot, there's another visual for that. And like I told you earlier, our visual for correlative conjunctions. Okay, now for our literature anthology, we're going to begin reading some of our poems. Now, while we go through these poems, listen for examples of imagery, listen for examples of personification. Uh, some of the poems that we're going to be reading are called free verse poems. So the notes I've added into our weekly notes, but a free verse poem is basically a kind of poem that does not need to rhyme. It doesn't need to follow a particular pattern. So it's free to be in any form that the writer wants it to be. Let's go ahead and read through our first poem called The Drum. Genre. Poetry. The Drum. Daddy says the world is a drum, tight and hard, and I told him I'm going to beat out my own rhythm. Nikki Giovanni. Essential question. What shapes a person's identity? Read how poets capture experiences that change people. Birdfoot's Grandpa. The old man must have stopped our car two dozen times to climb out and gather into his hands the small toads blinded by our lights and leaping, live drops of rain. The rain was falling, a mist about his white hair, and I kept saying, you can't save them all. Accept it. Get back in. We've got places to go. But leathery hands, full of wet brown life, knee-deep in the summer roadside grass, he just smiled and said, they have places to go to, too. Joseph Bruchak. Now, as we read through these poems, you're seeing a lot of examples of imagery. So when you're seeing that uh, in Birdfoot's Grandpa, when it says the rain was falling a mist about his white hair, you can imagine that, right? You, you're seeing examples of imagery where you're able to picture these things in your head. He says, uh, his leathery hands are full of wet brown life, knee deep in the summer roadside grass. So these are things you can picture in your head, you can imagine. So these examples of imagery are used to make the reading more interesting for the reader by helping you paint a picture in your imagination. Our last poem for our literature anthology is called From My Chinatown. So here you're going to see a lot of personification in this poem. So listen for it carefully. From My Chinatown. Twelve hours every day, the needle on her sewing machine gobbles up the fabric, turning miles of cloth into pants and jackets, skirts and dresses. After supper, I sit beside my mother, listening to the hum of the motor, the soft chatter of the hungry needle. Sometimes I fall asleep beside her, the sound of her work, a lullaby. Come, mock. So here we're seeing a lot of examples of personification. So we can see that the sewing machine gobbles up the fabric, or uh, listening to the hum of the motor, or the soft patter of the hungry needle. These are all examples of uh, the author using personification to give more interest to his writing piece. Now, our next poem that we're going to read in our reading and writing workshop is called Climbing Blue Hill. Climbing Blue Hill. When the yellow leaves begin to glimmer among the green ones, we hike up Blue Hill through an early morning mist. It's not much farther, boys. 
my grandfather bellows happily, his words an echo of all the other times he's had to urge us up a steep trail. I hear the comforting squeak of his boots as the ground's chill breath whispers against our ankles and the overgrown branches tug curiously at my hair. Abruptly, the trail spits us out, onto gray rock, into blue sky and sunlight. My brother shouts, shoves me aside, races to the low bushes huddled against the wind. His fingers tug at the tiny leaves. Look, blueberries, he yells, and we gobble the blue sweetness up, my brother, my grandfather, and me. Andrew Fayer now, as we read through climbing big blue or climbing blue hill, we see a lot of examples of imagery and personification that the author uses throughout the entire poem. So from the very first line, you're seeing examples of, of imagery when the author or the poem poet says, when the yellow leaves begin to glimmer among the green ones, we hike up blue hill through an early morning mist. So you're already getting a description or a picture in your head. You're starting to imagine leaves, yellow golden leaves, peeking in between the green ones. You can picture that. We also see examples of personification when, for example, in the third stanza, it says, I hear the comforting squeak of his boots as the ground's chill breath whispers against our ankles and the overgrown branches tug curiously at my hair. So the branches tugging at her hair or the, the, um, that cool air whispering against their ankles, those are examples of personification. Another one is, abruptly the trail spits us out. That's another example of personification. And then we see a lot of imagery onto gray rock with blue sky and sunlight. So all of these are examples that you see throughout the poem that help you, that help keep the reader interested and help to paint a picture in your head of the entire setting of the poem. The next two poems are called My Name is Ivy, and our last one is called Collage. So remember, focus on our essential question about what these different poets think shape a person's individuality. My Name is Ivy. Why did I name you after a plant? Look, this is Ivy, my mother explains, pointing at an intricate fan of glossy green heart shaped leaves decorating the side of our house. Ivy will grip onto anything, will grow where it wants to go, will use its long skinny fingers to find a way over brick walls, up stone walls, will climb a roof and keep on going until it touches the stars. Bryce Neal Collage. Grandma gave me her eyes. Eyes of a panther, Grandpa whispers. Grandpa gave me his nose. A bumpy, rocky road of a nose, Grandma scoffs. Dad gave me his long, skinny toes. My roots reach back to the lemurs, he jokes. Mama gave me her lopsided smile. Don't ever lose it, she warns. And I gave them my heart. It's big enough to hold you all, I say. Maria Diaz Make Connections What do these poets think shapes a person's individuality? What has influenced you? Now, for both of these poems, you're seeing the author using things like imagery. You're seeing personification when we're reading the poem, My Name is Ivy, about how uh, the ivy plant will use its long, skinny fingers to find a way over bricks and stone walls. Even though we know ivy plants don't actually have fingers, but we know that their their stems will kind of cling onto a wall and grow along it. Uh, we'll see also a lot of imagery in the collage poem, where we're describing the different uh, features that she had gotten from her family members and how she is a collage made up of all the different parts of her family. So grandma's eyes, you know, the eyes of a panther or grand, grandpa's nose being bumpy and rocky. 
or dad's long skinny toes or mom's lopsided smile. The words that the author is using is helping you to visualize, helping you to develop that picture in your head of exactly what those things look like. For the poem, my name, uh, my name is Ivy. It's describing all the different things that make this girl unique, just like an ivy plant is unique. Just like we were talking about the collage poem, all the unique parts that made up this author. Uh, my name is Ivy does that as well, where it's talking about strength and resilience and how uh, ivy plants are able to grow where they want to grow, you know, even in a difficult spot, they will grow around things and grow up and over things to get to where they need to be. Next part of our notes, we're going to talk about free verse poems and the theme, and that will be it for this week. Free verse. Free verse does not have a rhyme scheme or a metrical pattern, may have irregular lines. Find text evidence. I can tell that My Name is Ivy is a free verse poem because it does not have a rhyme scheme or a metrical pattern. My name is Ivy. Why did I name you after a plant? Look, this is Ivy, my mother explains, pointing at an intricate fan of glossy green heart-shaped leaves decorating the side of our house. Ivy will grip onto anything, will grow where it wants to go, will use its long skinny fingers to find a way over brick walls, up stone walls, will climb a roof and keep on going until it touches the stars. Bryce Neal I wonder why the lines are all spread out. The lines in this poem are not the same length. The poet chose to give the lines a zigzag pattern. Theme The theme is the main message or lesson in a poem. Identifying the key details in a poem can help you determine the theme. Find text evidence. All of the poems in this lesson are about identity, but each poem has a different theme. I'll reread collage on page 441 and look for key details to determine the theme of the poem. Graphic organizer. Detail. Grandma gave me her eyes. Detail. Grandpa gave me his nose. Detail. And I gave them my heart. Theme. Families are a collage that everyone contributes to. Caption. Details will help you identify the theme. Okay, that takes us to the end of our notes and our readings for this week. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I hope you have an amazing day. Take care. Bye-bye.